All right, you can go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 1, we'll continue in our series. So as you're turning there to Mark chapter 1, just imagine with me, if you would, for a moment, a uh, struggling company, uh, you know, just losing out to the competition, something like that. So they hire a new CEO uh, to lead them in hopefully a new direction. And this guy comes in and he's got some bold, sweeping changes that he's going to make. Uh, and so, you know, he, he, he's, he's shutting down the microwave division and, and he's uh, rebranding, new name for the company or something like that. And, and immediately it, there's this sort of response on the board of like, okay, but, you know, that was our most profitable division and we got branding out there. Like, if people know who we are. They trust us and you've just changed all that. And so it, it, it almost exposes this fault line in the board. Like, we want to go in a new direction. That's why we hired you. We just wanted you to go in the new direction that we envisioned, <laughs> the one that hasn't necessarily been working for us either, but that's okay. So we get these strong opinions about which way to go, and that's the terrible burden of following, of course. We all know that. We all have to follow somebody somewhere along uh, the line. The terrible burden of following is that so often we think we know better than the people that we have to follow, and of course it might even be true. Like You might actually be smarter than your boss. Uh, that's not ever true here, I know that, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> I don't even want to know what the heckle was there, so something bad. So we, we, we think we know better, but what, what, what then? What do we do? Because you get just two possible responses. You can trust and follow or distrust, and, and let's be clear here, distrust really means you trust yourself. So trust the other person and follow, or trust yourself and resist. And of course, that's going to go badly. One, one of you is getting fired, right, at the end of that uh, kind of thing. Now, I, I use this as an illustration because it's not that different from the Christian life. I mean, we have strong opinions about how we think our lives should go. And so then we've got two possible responses yet again. <laughs> when he doesn't do what you want, will you follow Jesus or ask him to follow you and your agenda? That's the lesson that the disciples are going to learn immediately in their ministry, almost from uh, the first moment of their call, as we'll see. So we're going to walk through uh, four different scenes, but that really trace this whole idea. Um, and so let's start with the first one, the call itself, just what Jesus asks of us. Let me read Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 16 to 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him." Okay, so set the stage a little bit, especially from where we were last week. We've got this unexpected king reigning over an unexpected kingdom right from the get-go. He just messes with our expectations. What should a Messiah do? Especially this Messiah who is God, by the way, as we already saw last week. Well, he's got he's to announce himself and, and step onto the world stage. You know, something big and flashy. Like, he can be in Israel, that's fine. But he's got to be in Jerusalem, working with the leaders and the celebrities of the time. And instead, he's in Galilee, gathering a ragtag bunch of fishermen to follow him. Like, the new CEO is messing up from day one. The equivalent is, you know, this is transferring the corporate headquarters from New York to Tulsa. We're like, you know that New York is a big market, right? And no one lives in Tulsa. That's not a thing. And so there's these concerns, right? From there. Well, that's what we have here. Then comes the call, what Jesus asks of his followers. And what is the call that he asks of his followers? That they, you know, follow him. Complicated, I know. But it is shocking because... He does say, you can read it here, follow me, come follow me. Not follow Torah or a, 
uh, program that we're going to develop. No, we're, it's a call to follow a person, not to adhere to a set of doctrines, not to keep a list of rules, not some, you know, following some nebulous way of love or a vague, squishy sense of spirituality, but to follow Jesus himself. This is a relational call to walk behind him, to follow in his footsteps. And of course, this is just fleshing out repent and believe from last week, verse 15. What exactly does that mean? We turn from your former way of life as we talked about and you turn to Jesus himself. Believe in and trust in him. Now even more shocking than the call to follow a person is that this call takes precedence over everything else. Like the very first sign that you're not actually following Jesus but just asking him to follow you and your agenda is that you're only willing to give up what you want to give up. So Jesus comes into your life and you can say, you can have that and that and that and that and this is untouchable. This is mine. You don't get any say in this part of my life. It's a danger we face. So what I love about this too is that uh, these first two examples that we get challenge really every culture that's ever existed on the planet because it challenges both traditional culture, if I could call it that, and modern culture. So in a traditional culture, a strong group culture, family or clan is everything. And so your whole purpose is to serve the group. You know, this is Godfather style, like don't ever go against the family kind of thing. You are there to increase your family's wealth or status or whatever else. Of course, in modern culture, more like ours here in the West, highly individualistic, you do what you want in order to you know, self-actualize, something like that. And your career is a huge part of that for us in the West. I mean, what's the first question you ask somebody after you learn their name? What do you do for a living? Because that's who you are in our culture. Your career defines you. And this, by the way, is why we would move away from our family, that strong group. We'd move across the country to pursue our career because we're just, we're individualistic. Not to say one is right or one is wrong. It's just the two cultures that we have. Jesus comes in and he asks the first four disciples to leave both. (laughs) There you go. Just all of it gets left behind in order to follow him. That is the radical call right there. So he looks at Simon and Andrew and says, your nets, your livelihood, your career, could you leave that behind? He turns to James and John and says, your dad, I know he's there. Can you leave him behind? This is what Jesus says elsewhere in much stronger terms. Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Challenging words for us in part just because this reflects Hebrew idiom that we don't have today where hate is a, is a relative term. So it, it's a question of priority. In comparison, it could almost look like I hate this because I am so committed to this right here so that I just walked away from my nets, my livelihood, in order to follow Jesus. But as soon as there's something that you won't give up, as soon as there's that something where you say, that's mine, then it's clear you're not following him. You're asking him to follow you and your agenda. Like you're, you're getting Jesus to help you get something else. Love what he gives. Love the peace. Love the blessing. Love whatever else. Just don't love him in himself. Now don't miss this also in the midst of the radical call here is the call to ministry too. And this is for all of us. This is disciples, not people being called into vocational ministry or something like that. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you come follow me. I'm gonna make you fishers of people. And so you're going to call others to follow this person too, to preach the kingdom of God, the good news. Now, if we're called to this ourselves and called to call others to it, it's, it's fair to ask why. <laughs> like, convince me a little bit here. Why give it all up? Who is Jesus to warrant this sort of commitment? And that's where we go next. So let me read verses 21 to 28 where we look at the Christ, who he is exactly. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. 
The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. All right, quick note as we dig into this part here. Uh, This begins a 24-hour period of ministry for Jesus. It'll take us actually through verse 38, most of the next section too. But this 24-hour period, so one day that is really representative of so much of his ministry because we'll see what happens on it. We got teaching and exorcism and healing and proclamation. This is just a huge part of what Jesus does when he's here. We get the first two in this scene teaching and exorcism. And both of those activities impress upon the onlookers his authority, which is the key word in this section. First, he teaches with authority. There's something about his teaching that is just qualitatively different than the teaching they've heard from the scribes or religious leaders. This makes sense because the scribes or religious leaders, they have a derivative authority. So they're standing on the shoulders of others in proclaiming what they're proclaiming, teaching what they're teaching. And so you would listen to a scribe talk and they would say, well, according to Rabbi so-and-so and and Rabbi so-and-so, like this is it. There's nothing new, nothing interesting. They're just helping clarify some of the conversations that are going on. Honestly, it's not that different for me. Like, this is the authority I have, a derivative authority. I'm looking at the text And oftentimes we'll go, hey, this is what Augustine had to say, this is what Calvin had to say, this is what Edwards had to say about this. Here are some commentators who actually know Greek and Hebrew at a different level than I do. Here's what they, and and nothing new in what I'm teaching. If I ever start teaching something new, it's time to fire me, because that's heresy. All right, like we got the faith once for all entrusted to the saints here. So that's the teaching that they're used to, and all of a sudden now we get a teaching with authority. And that word itself is important. If you were to parse it out, pull it apart in the Greek, it means from being or from substance, if you will. You could almost translate it as uh, from the original stuff, like the stuff that it's all made out of. Of course, you get hints of that even in our English word because authority has that word author in it, like the one who wrote this whole story. So Jesus, he's not expounding on what people already know or quoting others. No, this would be a little bit like if Tolkien himself showed up in the Shire to talk to Frodo about what's coming. Like Gandalf, Galadriel, they got wisdom, no doubt, but Tolkien created the place. He gets more authority because he is the author, and that's Jesus. The authority he has is the authority of the author. This, by the way, is one of my problems with the whole God is still speaking movement where we take the Bible seriously but not literally. It assumes that the author didn't know what was coming later on in the story, and so we got to tweak some of his words that weren't so good. All right, so that's the authority in his teaching, but he takes it to the next level then when he demonstrates his authority even over demons. Now you're going to see this in our series throughout the first half of Mark especially. The demons know the answers to the questions that people have. So even right here, you got people going, who is this guy? Where does he get this authority? And the demon's going, let me help you out here. He's the Holy One of God. That's who he is. And we're going to see this sort of cosmic conflict again and again in Mark, these power encounters, if you will. Because Jesus is not just the suffering servant in Mark, but he is also the victorious king. I mean, that's there in the title of our series. Cross, yes, suffering servant, but crown, also victorious king. And so the demons obey his commands perfectly. And I love, too, just the contrast between these two power groups. The demon, as he's coming out of the man, you know, hysterics and shrieking and screaming and all the rest, and Jesus is just, shh, be quiet. it's It's just a wave of the hand and it's over. Which is a good reminder for us, too, by the way, because the conflict is still here in the world. It's not often on the surface here in the West. You go to some other parts of the world, it is on the surface. I have seen it. It is ugly. But oftentimes we walk into this thinking like, okay, you know, I I watched The Exorcist or something. I know how this goes down. I got to have like cloves of garlic around my neck and I'm shouting incantations. No, 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 no. It's just quiet authority in the name of Jesus. 
All of this is important, but the crowd's response, I think, is maybe most important here. Because they get it, at least in one sense. They say this is a new teaching and with authority. And the proof of that authority is in the encounter. And the news spreads, as, as it would. <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, this is what we want. This is what we pray for here at City View. That the news about Jesus would spread. But not so fast. At least not yet. And that'll take us to the conundrum. How we respond to this Christ who has come calling us to follow him. Let me read verses 29 to 39 for us. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. And Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So, same day, remember, still in this 24-hour period. uh, Synagogue is over, and so he does what we all do after church, right? Go home, have the big meal kind of thing. Heads back to Peter's house, Simon's house, same person, if that's confusing, Simon Peter. Heads back to Peter's house to eat. Uh, I just want to help us out here too because sometimes when we read Bible stories, it, it sounds like this happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But to remember that this is, this is history, like real earth and dirt involved in this. Archaeologists are pretty confident that they know this house. We have this house there in Capernaum that was a fisherman's house and it has religious graffiti in it indicating that it was used as a place of worship early on. So we're talking about a real place that they go back to Peter's house again, and his mother-in-law is sick. And so Jesus does what Jesus does, which is to restore people to what they were intended to be. And then she does what we do, or at least what we should do, which is to get up and serve. (laughs) Why does God restore us? He saves us to serve. That's our calling. Then things get interesting. Because now it's sunset. Sunset on the day when they went to synagogue. So we're talking about the Sabbath. So sunset on the Sabbath means now the Sabbath is over, which means now the multitudes can come to Jesus and bring their sick and demonized to be healed or to have the demons cast out. And so Jesus continues to demonstrate his authority, heals many, casts out many demons, and, no surprise, we've already started to see this, would not let them speak because they know who he was. It is a little interesting, though. Like, why not let them spread the news? Like, this feels like, if it's coming from the enemy especially, it's probably true, we should listen. All right, so this might be some good PR for Jesus, but he knows, of course, that there will be false expectations coming along with this. We know what a Messiah should do, and we're going to put that on him. It's going to be a recurring theme in Mark. We'll actually see it unfold here even in this scene. Uh, I actually love it. There are kind of three main themes in Mark uh, that I see, and all of them are in this passage, by the way. You get the cosmic conflict on the one hand. Uh, You get the so-called messianic secret, which is what we see here. Uh, And then you get the disciples falling flat on their faces over and over and over again, which we will also see in just a moment. So keep your eye out for those themes as we go. All right, still same day, ministers late into the night, sleeps but just for a bit because he rises early to pray, to experience intimacy with his father. Now in this dual nature that he possesses, fully God and fully man. Of course, he has existed in perfect fellowship with the father from eternity past, but now he's experiencing it as a human. It was Stanley Jones, I think, who said that prayer is like time exposure to God. The image there is of a photographic plate. We don't have those anymore because we have digital cameras. But you remember how this used to work, right? Where you expose the film to the light, and the longer it's exposed, the more of the image it would bear. And that's what prayer is. We expose ourselves to the Father so that more of his image is stamped on us. But of course, Jesus doesn't need any more of God's image. He is the image of God, the exact representation of his being, as Hebrews tells us. So what is he doing? Well, 
like last week. He's identifying with us. And he is living as a human in dependence on God. And there is just an implicit rebuke in there for all of us, isn't there? Like if Jesus needed to carve out time for the Father, what about us? Like are you really going to try the self-reliance thing? This feels like a bad idea. I could say plenty more about that. But something else is happening while he prays. And that's that the disciples wake up and they discover that he's missing. So it says they went to look for him, which is fine, although the translation is just a little bit too weak. It really says that they, they pursued or even hunted him. It's kind of the connotation of the verb that's used there. Why are they hunting for him? Well, because well, it says the crowds were looking for him. Again, maybe just a little bit too weak. The word used seeking gets used a lot in Mark. It's almost always used of the religious leaders who were seeking Jesus to kill him. (laughs) So it definitely has this sense of seeking to control or exercise power over, at least when it's used in Mark. You put the two together, what do you get? We get those two choices that we talked about on display. You're going to follow Jesus. You're going to ask Jesus to follow you and your agenda. Like Peter, you're going to hunt him down to get him to do what you want. Like the crowds are going to seek to control him. We can see that that's what's going on, by the way, just in what happens next. Simon Peter comes to him and and paraphrase a little bit, but he says, look, Jesus, everybody loves you. Like, I don't know if you know this, you are kind of a big deal around here. People are interested. We need to, we need to harness this momentum. We need to ride this wave to earthly glory. And Jesus says, hmm, let's go somewhere else. Like that's, that's not going to go well for us. He, he recognized what's happening. These people are coming not to follow me, but to use me because they want what I have to often offer. And we're the same way often. I mean, how many of us pray fervently when crisis comes? To open the word of God and dig deep when we are confused. But when things are going well... I mean, maybe it's still there, but it becomes perfunctory pretty quickly. So we come to Jesus when we need help with a problem, which is fine. We certainly should do that. But come to get him to serve our agenda. That's why Mark emphasizes his authority right before this episode. Again, he is the author, which means we can trust him with our stories. Let me just take a, a common example. Like, how do you respond when there is unanswered prayer? Of course, you know there's no such thing as unanswered prayer, right? Every prayer is answered. God is attentive to our prayers. It's just we don't always like the answer that we get, and so we pretend that he doesn't answer them. What, what, do, you, what do you do? You, you pray for something that doesn't happen, and how, how, how do we respond? Disbelief or bitterness or anger? Or do we trust? When he said no, it's because he's got something better. If I knew what he knows, I would choose what he's chosen for me here. Jesus pulls the disciples away because he does know something that Peter has not caught on to yet. Heads into the countryside, away from the crowds. Of course, the crowds are going to find him, but he pulls away from the crowds at this point. Why? Because he's interested in the quality of a response to him, not the quantity of responses he gets. And what a temptation that is for us in ministry, isn't it? I'm not talking about me as like the guy on staff or something, but all of us here Have this temptation to go, yeah, bigger crowds, which by the way means bigger budgets, which is exciting, of course. So it's like, get them in the door, however we can, a flash in the pan, exciting ministry versus what we see Jesus model and we'll see Jesus model throughout the Gospel of Mark, which is small, relational, and deep. I think of like journey groups. We are committed to Jesus' model here at City View. Think of journey groups. Can you think of any ministry less exciting than journey groups? here's what we're going to do. I'm going to grab like four guys. We've got some ladies. They're going to grab like four ladies. And we're going to meet together for the next three years. And at the end of that, maybe, you know, half of them will start their own journey groups. But what happens in those three years? <laughs> because what we see in Mark is gospel. We can go deep. We can get some roots down deep in people's hearts so that those half that go off to start journey groups are able to replicate the ministry so that five becomes 15 pretty quickly, becomes 45, and then the math gets tricky. And that's what we're hoping for here. So, and here's the conundrum. (laughs) 
This Jesus who comes is very popular. A lot of temptation attached to his presence. Submit to his authority or seek to control his agenda. Follow him or ask him to follow us. It feels like we could be done here. We kind of got to the end of it. But we're not done yet. Because there is one more scene. And I'm going to tell you what. It even feels a little bit unrelated, this scene. Except we have to read it because we sang about it and only Jesus can. So I'm locked in now. But I think it is related because this really addresses the motivation. This addresses the heart. This is a story that would move us to want to follow Jesus. And to trust him with the agenda. And so let's look at this now. The compassion. Why we follow. Verses 40 to 45. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So the leper comes to Jesus, and in coming to Jesus and throwing himself at Jesus' feet, he breaks every protocol. Like, this is a great time in history to talk about this. This is the person coming up to you in the grocery store, no mask, right in your face, no social distance, like snot running down their nose, hacking up a lung, and then, you know, shaking your hand kind of thing. And you're like, you can't do that! Go away! Unclean! And yet the leper does that. And I mean, it would be that shocking. Like, I'm not exaggerating. If anything, that's probably not shocking enough. So how could the leper possibly do this and walk right up to Jesus like that? It's because he clearly believes that it is worth the risk. What Jesus has to offer is worth the rebuke he might get, the rejection he might get. Note, he doesn't doubt Jesus' ability. If you're willing, you can make me clean. I know that. I don't even think he doubts his willingness, by the way. That whole, if you're willing, he's not like, mm, I, I could see you going either way on this one. This is uh, sort of the equivalent of saying, if you would be so kind, would you dot, dot, dot. You're not actually questioning the person's kindness. You're assuming the person's kindness in asking it. That's what we have here too. But it says that Jesus was indignant. If you look down, you probably got a text note at the bottom, if you're in the NIV at least, where it says, many manuscripts say, Jesus was filled with compassion. So we've got to do a little excursus on text criticism here. So text criticism is where we figure out what exactly the original manuscripts said. And here's how you do it for the most part, is you look at the oldest and best manuscripts. What do they have here? But if those are divided, which is what we have in this instance, you got some other options, things you got to look at. And one of them is, which is the harder reading? Because the harder reading is almost certainly the original reading. Because what happens is scribes go... Okay, that's tricky. Let me, let me help us out here. If I change this word, it'll make more sense. So which is the harder reading here? Jesus was filled with compassion and healed the person. Jesus was in a rage and healed the person. Clearly, it's the indignant one. So I think NIV is right. I think that's what the manuscript said. It doesn't really matter, though. And here's why. Because Jesus' compassion toward the leper is his rage towards leprosy. It's exactly what we see at Lazarus' tomb where Jesus is again in a rage. Why? Because he is so angry at the power that sin and sickness and death have over his children. And he is indignant. And that's what we have here too. So he's filled with compassion for the leper, indignant at leprosy. And then he reaches out and touches the leper. I'm willing. Be clean very intentionally touches the leper. He does not need to do this. Like Jesus healed many people without touching them at all. There's nothing magic that happens. You know, lightning doesn't come out of your fingers or something like that. So he does not need to do this and yet he does it on purpose. And you think about what that would have meant. This is a guy for as long as he has had leprosy has not been touched. And again, we know a little something of this in a COVID world. There's very little touching at this point within your household, sure. But there are probably people that you see that you want to hug and you can't. And think of that. You have not been touched in a decade. 
for Jesus to do it on purpose. What that would mean. Now, why is it that you couldn't touch lepers? Because lepers are unclean. And we've all read Leviticus. We know how this goes. If you touch something unclean, you become unclean. But not with Jesus. Because Jesus is not just holy. Jesus is the source of all holiness. Something unclean comes into contact with Jesus, it gets made holy. And that's our story, by the way. What a powerful reminder for those of us who have been defiled by sin, which is all of us, of course. But I'm thinking especially of those who feel it because of abuse or something like that. To remember that Christ's holiness is greater than our sin and shame and guilt. And with this then, Jesus sends the man away, sends him to the priests, because the priests are the ones who pronounce the cleansing. So like this is the negative COVID test. Where you can go, I can go back to work now. Like that's what he's doing here. It is a little bit of a reminder, of course, that Jesus is not throwing away the law, not by any means. He's come not to abolish it, but to fulfill it, he tells us elsewhere. And so here's what the law says you're supposed to do. Go do that. But then, more important for us here at least, is he warns him not to tell anyone as he goes. Why? And it's this so-called messianic secret, probably because of what we've seen. Crowds are going to start looking for him, seeking to control him if they hear of this. Now, the leper doesn't obey. And this is really tricky for us, whether he was wrong or not, because you totally understand where he's coming from. Like he's maybe making his way to Jerusalem. We don't know if he gets there or not. He can go into towns for the first time in however many years. So he's there in the marketplaces. Of course he's going to talk to people. He hasn't gotten to do this in forever. But it causes Jesus problems, the fact that he does this. Because people do come to him as a result and seek to control him. And so it says that he is you know, exiled to the lonely places as a result. Do you see what's happened there, though? What this means? In essence, Jesus has traded places with the leper. The leper is there in the towns now, talking to people, high fives, hugs, everything he hasn't gotten to experience. And it's Jesus who's cast out into the wilderness, can't be around people. And of course, that substitution, that beautiful exchange, is the essence of the gospel, where Jesus switches places with us. And this is even more pronounced because leprosy really is a parable of our sin. It's what R.C. Trench said years ago, that it was an outward, visible sign of our innermost spiritual corruption. I mean, think about leprosy and how it connects to sin. It's an internal condition slowly progresses, eating away at us, destroying as it goes, bringing one to ultimate ruin. I mean, that's sin in a nutshell, of course. And leprosy was a walking death. It was a death sentence. And that's exactly what sin is for us as well, except we're talking about spiritual and eternal death. This is going to be important, of course, this, this leprosy is parable, because there are two lies that sin would have you believe, and both would keep you from the leper's boldness in coming to Jesus. The first lie is that you are not a sinner. Like, yeah, you got issues. We all got issues. But you know, sin is such a strong thing. And think about how leprosy works. Leprosy is famous, of course, for, you know, like you lose fingers and things like that. But how do you lose fingers? Leprosy doesn't cause you to lose fingers. Leprosy dulls your senses, dulls the nerve endings, so that you're working at home with a hammer and you smack your finger and you don't realize it and so you don't care for it and it's bloodied and it gets infected and there's gangrene and you lose a finger. And how easy would it be then to go, why are you blaming leprosy for the fact that my finger's gone? It wasn't leprosy, it was the hammer that did this. Isn't that us? We blame our circumstances for what is clearly our sin nature's fault. So there's the first lie. You are not a sinner, but you are. And then the second lie is almost the opposite one. You are so sinful that you're beyond help. And you might as well just stay away from people, stay away from Jesus. Jesus couldn't or wouldn't save someone like me. Like if he knew what I had done, which of course he does, by the way, he's omniscient God, but if he knew what I had done, he would never save someone like me. And yet here we see Jesus' power and willingness to save if we come to him and admit our need. But when we do that, he willingly trades places with us. 
And the, the, the shadow of the cross so clearly call, falls across verse 45 here when Jesus is forced into the lonely places. It actually makes me think of Jesus on the cross. He's got the two thieves on either side of him. And we read in Luke 23 verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Bit of irony, because of course that's exactly what Jesus was doing. That's why he's on the cross. But he wasn't doing it the way the thief wanted him to do it. That's it again. He, he, he's asking Jesus to follow him and his agenda. What I would like is off the cross, be able to go back about my way. Maybe I'll reform myself. Maybe I'll get back into crime. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. But would you follow my agenda? Would you save me from this? And not what matters most and what matters most to you, God. But the other thief gets it. And he turns to Jesus, he rebukes the first thief, or turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom today. I love that, by the way. He's talking to a guy who is dying on a cross right then. And he's like, this is your enthronement ceremony. Like, this is the coronation. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom today? And Jesus says, what? Yeah, okay. Today, Paradise. But you see that switching places again. This thief gets paradise because Jesus gets all the torments of hell when the wrath of God is poured out on him for our sin. Jesus trades places with him spiritually. He was crucified when he wasn't guilty to bear our guilt away. He was made unclean. That's what Paul says in in, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. You made him who had no sin to be sin. To embody uncleanness and sin. He was made unclean and cast out so that we could be cleansed and welcomed in. That we would become the very righteousness of God. Jesus the Messiah has the authority to save us truly. And he offers us a better salvation than what we would ever dream for ourselves. But that just means the question is there for us even today. Will you follow Jesus? Or will you ask Jesus to follow you and your, frankly, puny agenda? Let's pray. Lord, we know that the call is the same for us today. That you are calling us even now to follow you, the person Jesus crucified on our behalf, raised to life as the first fruits of the resurrection. But we know that that call involves you getting first place in our hearts and lives. We see what we would need to leave behind. We see the commitment, the cost of following you. We understand that you have the authority, but Everything in our flesh, in our sin nature, cries out saying, I don't want to give that up. So Lord, would you help us even today? Give us grace. Strengthen us by your spirit to follow you fully. To hold back no part of our lives from you, but to trust you, the author, to write our stories in the best possible way. Help us, Lord, to count the cost of following you today as we sang just a moment ago, wherever you lead, whatever it costs to follow you anywhere because we know, we know that you have the power, that you have the compassion, the goodness, the grace, the holiness, everything to make you worthy of that commitment. We confess it now, Lord. Make it true of us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. All right, would you stand for the doxology? Just a quick reminder as you're standing then that uh, we'd love for you to stay and connect and whatnot. Just please do it outside uh, and we'll see you out there in a moment. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen and amen.